The time now is 10.35. We present Injury Time, starring Robert Bathurst, Martin Bergman, Rory McGrath, Jimmy Mulville, and Emma Thompson. Good evening. Um, as you probably realise, uh, the BBC came up to us five, and mm -hmm. they asked us to do a, a brand new comedy show. And of course, we were delighted to turn around to them and say, no. Good, good, night. Night. good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> but then we thought, well, why not? I mean, it's better than signing on the dole. Uh, it's very easy money, and they did offer us a fiver. And then we bumped up to a fiver each. We just wanted the show to have a kind of ad hoc feeling about it, you know, kind of spontaneous, no rehearsal, mm -hmm. nothing to do rehearse. Contrived. Precise. Slick. Or learnt. Or fat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we're really excited about doing this radio show, in fact. I mean, you know, radio really is the medium, oh, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 for yeah, yeah. There's, mm. there's so much you can do with radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. <laughs> What's on the telly? What's on telly? Oh, yeah. Television, yes, yes. Well, on Monday, there's a film of Stuart Hall getting rotten drunk and picking a fight with someone in a pub. That's, it's a knockout. <laughs> <laughs> on the same night, Anthea Redfern is interviewing Britt Eklund in Blankety Blank. <laughs> <laughs> Followed by our popular serial concerning a top international banker who goes mad and dresses up in women's clothing. That's Telford's change. <laughs> and on Wednesday, Dennis Norden talks to a sex therapist in It'll Be Alright on the Night. <laughs> <laughs> Film of the week's on Wednesday. There's fun for all the family when we show a Norman Wisdom movie. Well, fun for Norman Wisdom's family, anyway. <laughs> And Thursday night sees Arthur Negus talking to Richard Murdoch, Sandy Powell, and Arthur Askey. That's a life among the antiques. <laughs> and for the kids on Tuesday, there's Animal Magic, in which Johnny Morris will be sawing a badger in half. <laughs> right, well, tonight on Injury Time, we won't be attacking any politicians, so instead we'll be having a go at Clement Freud. <laughs> LAUGHTER The caterer, dog handler, just a minute, panellists. Oh, hesitation. <laughs> um, MP for Ely, where he's been MP for... Uh, repetition, you said MP twice. <laughs> and one of the few Liberal MPs not to have been accused of... Uh, deviation. <laughs> Have you got Mr. Bun the baker? No. Have you got Master Sawdust the carpenter's son? Yes, yes. Here, have the damn thing. Happy families, happy families. There's another set to me. Mr. and Mrs. Sawdust, Master and Miss Sawdust the carpenter family. That's three sets to me, three sets. I lead, I'm leading. All right, all right, all right. Just get on with the game. All right. I don't need to get up a tea. Now, let's see. Have you got Mr. Bribe the policeman? No. Have you got Mr. Tax Exile the miner? No. <laughs> Have you got Mr. Late the Postman? Yes. Mr. Late the Postman, Mrs. Late the Postwoman, Master and Miss Late the Postman's children. No, no, I can't let you have Mr. Late the Postman. My card beats that. What card? Mr. Lockjaw, the Alsatian. Don't <laughs> be so bloody juvenile. Oh, don't use language like that, dear. Let's get on with the game, shall we? Now, have you got Ms. Person, the feminist? You're, you're making these up. No, I'm not. Look, I've got a complete set. Master Money and Miss Money, the banker's children, Mr. Money, the banker, and Mrs. Soldier. It's not a set. Not with Mrs. Soldier in it. Oh, come on, Mr. Soldier's serving in Germany for three years. These things happen. You know what goes on. <laughs> yes, as a matter of fact, I do know what goes on. For instance, have you got Miss Dollybird, the secretary? I'm sure you must have. Oh, well, we can all play that game, dear. Have you got Mr. Daly, the milkman, eh? <laughs> or Mr. Once a Fortnight, the Coleman? <laughs> Don't be absurd. You're mad. You're utterly mad. You're annoyed, because I always beat you when we play Happy Families. Cobblers. Don't talk to me like that. No, look, Mr. Shoemaker, Mrs. Shoemaker... Oh, stop it, stop it! <laughs> My God, you've been cheating. You've been cheating in a game of Happy Families. That's not Mr. Shoemaker at all. That's Mr. Chop, the butcher. You've coloured in his apron with a crayon and drawn a shoe in his hand. <laughs> God, how low can you stoop? Show me your other cards. 
I don't believe it. This one is a playing card from an ordinary pack. That's not Mr. Bender, the transvestite at all. It's the Queen of Diamonds. <laughs> Look, stop making such a fuss about our game of cards. Don't shout, we'll wake the baby. We haven't got a baby. Exactly! <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, darling. I, I should have realised you. You want a baby, don't you? You know I do. All right, then. Here. Mr. Baby, the child welfare man. <laughs> Lady bed with the banging in your head that you just can't bear. With me is a young gentleman by the name of Ronnie Knackers. Now, Ronnie, I believe you are a punk. No, I bleed it eight. <laughs> I'm a hell's angel. Uh, but I thought that the orange and blue spiky haircut, the safety pin through your nose, and the dustbin liner you're wearing were very much the traits of the punk rocker. No, I'm wearing those because. Yeah, that's right, I'm a punk rocker. <laughs> <laughs> I've beat up Hell's Angels. That's a source of my confusion. Yeah, yeah. I see. Now, uh, Sydney, Sydney Cranium, you, I believe, are a skinhead. No, I bleed no. I'm a suede head. <laughs> a suede head? Yeah, it's a sort of skinhead, but we've got slightly longer hair than skinheads, and we wear suede bother boots. Crush puppies. <laughs> Well, could, you, could you just tell me about this new gang that's just formed the Rude Boys? I hate Rude Boys. Rude Boys make me puke. And do, do you beat up Rude Boys? Uh, no. Why not? Because if you beat them up, they're rude to you. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't like that. You don't like them being rude to you? No, it's rude. I wouldn't mind if they insulted us and said things like, Oh, I hate punks. Punks make me puke. But they don't. They come out with sardonic asides and muttered acerbic comments under their breath. I don't like that, it's rude. <laughs> don't you beat them up even if they're very rude to you? No, I tell me dad and he goes around there and he beats them up. <laughs> I see, so we see that um, youths have always banded together in some sort of identifiable sect. So, um, Dr. Samuel Hoffman, you're an imminent sociologist. No, believe me, I'm a social... Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I thought you said social worker. Yes, I'm a sociologist. <laughs> <Would> you... <laughs> Which is, is very different from a social worker. I hate social workers. If I thought you were calling me a social worker, I'd do you. I don't like. right, with me now is, is a member of one of the oldest gangs in the country. Good evening, John Pym. Uh, hello. Now then, John, <laughs> you, you are... A, uh, a roundhead. That's right, a mm. roundhead. <laughs> now, you go back even further than the Rockers and the Teds, uh, don't Yes, you? in fact, we are pre-Eddie Cochran. Yeah. <laughs> to 1640, in fact. Yeah. And have you any similarities to the parks, the mods, greasers? Well, your, your greaser has long, greasy hair, and, and we have short hair. Uh, not as short as your skinhead, but not as long as your suede. <laughs> now, your greaser, uh, he goes around on beat-up BSAs shouting, we hate mods, mods make us puke. Um, whereas we roundies, uh, we tend to go about on horseback shouting, out with the Presbyterian Royalists. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, all the gangs seem to have some sort of hero or other, some sort of leader figure. I mean, the Teds had Elvish, Wadi Wadi, the Mods have the Who, the Punks had Sid Vicious, and uh, I suppose for you it must be Oliver Cromwell, Lord Protector. Uh, no, Barry Manilow. <laughs> really? Why, why, why is that? Because uh, we like his music. And in his quieter moments, I believe he wants to see King Charles I hanged as much as we do. <laughs> Now, a lot of roundheads are getting into Neil Sadaka, yeah. but I think for our image of strict puritanical rule, he's a bit puffy. Mm. <laughs> now, who do you roundheads go around beating up? Cavaliers, mainly. But uh, there aren't many of those around. Uh, not now there aren't, so we soon saw them off. <laughs> yeah, one final question, John. Why do you go around in gangs beating people up? Protection. Protection from what? All these Vikings drawing about the place. <laughs> Thank you, and good night. Denim, the aftershave for men, for men who like women who like men. Denim, but I must stop drinking it, it's ruining my throat, I don't know. Okay, lads, there's no need to lose heart, right? Remember, 
you're still the best team in the East London and part of Essex Reserve Team Sunday League. <laughs> Whatever happens here in Germany playing Bayern Munich. <laughs> now, I'm sorry you didn't make more use of that early advantage when Bayern didn't turn up for the first quarter of an hour. <laughs> but there again, there again, you were only three goals down by the time they did arrive. <laughs> now, Jerry, now you spent almost all the first half warming up on the touchline. Up and down, up and down, up and down. You tie yourself out, son. I wouldn't mind if you were a substitute, but you're supposed to be in goal. <laughs> and by the way, all of you, a general point here, boys. Yep. Since we are playing in the 150,000 Olympic Stadium here, there's no need to put your coach down for goalposts. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Trevor, yep. um, that penalty. Yep. I mean, when you run up to take it, I had to shut my eyes and pray. And when I opened them, when I saw the net bulging, I thought my prayers had been answered. Then I looked again and I saw your wooden leg had come off. <laughs> now, in fact, Trevor, I won't be playing you for the second half. I mean, you know, you were playing all right, it's just that you did have a tendency to keep falling into touch. You see what I mean? <laughs> now, there's one sour incident I must refer to. I was appalled, simply appalled, appalled, just on half time when the referee blew up. <laughs> Now, I don't know whose idea the dynamite was, <laughs> but I can tell you it's done Anglo-German relations no good at all. OK. Now in, this, now, in the second half, we'll play our trump card, Mbopo. Hello. The Pele of the Bethnal Green Labour Club. Now, Mbopo. <laughs> Mbopo. Hello there. What's happening? Look at my lips, son. <laughs> I know you've only ever played with a coconut before. That's good. That's good. But tonight, we're playing with a FIFA standard leather ball. Oh, all right? That, leather ball. I know that, though. So I don't want you drilling two holes in it, trying to get the milk out. No, no. <laughs> right. Well, I see the replacement ref's just gone out. So come on. And remember, whatever happens today, we've still got the second leg. No offence, Trev. Yep. <laughs> and then we'll be back in England in front of our own supporter. I want you to think back to our last training session in Dagenham. Oh, yes, yeah. I remember When that. I had you dribbling around those dustbins. <laughs> now, you've barely beat those dustbins. <laughs> and that's the sort of form I want to see here tonight. Now, off you go. You know, I'm not in the habit of doing adverts for the first company that asks. That's why when the people from Carlsberg said to me, Orson, they said, do an advert for us, I refused. Then I tasted their lager. It was then I asked them for 200,000 pounds. <laughs> they agreed. So why don't you be like me, make adverts? Probably the easiest way for a fat old has-been to make a lot of money <laughs> in the world. <laughs> And now, a programme for younger licence payers. Here is a house. Here is a window. Here is a door. Here is a man from the Department of the Environment. Here is a bulldozer. Here is the M11. Right, now, as you may have noticed, licensed pairs, we try to give injury time a distinctive feel. Most radio comedy shows have some zany actors telling jokes and doing sketches, and the audience rock with laughter. Well, on this oh. programme, we've changed all that. Oh. <laughs> and another thing we've done to change the feel of the show is, in fact, to cut out all the live music. Actually, this wasn't our idea. <laughs> it was the idea of Aubrey Singer. The managing director <laughs> of radio. He thought it would be a gas to do injury time without the brilliant rock band we had lined up. Mm -hmm. And he did this by sacking five orchestras and making the Musicians' Union go on strike. <laughs> <laughs> and it's those people in the MU we'd like to salute now. So come on, lads. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Members of the Musicians' Union have been picketing the BBC for nearly six weeks now. In sun, rain and wind, they stood outside Broadcasting House. Mainly in the sun, though. 
There was one day when a few of them stood out in the rain, when it did look as if it was going to clear up, uh, but it didn't, so they packed up and went home. I think the man who was supposed to bring the flask of coffee didn't turn up. Anyway, thanks to those striking musicians, we've had to lose many of our programmes. Notably, Top of the Pops, The Black and White Minstrels, The Arthur Askey Variety Show. And we'd like to say a very, very, very big thank you to the MU for making this possible. Thanks, boys. We also very nearly lost all the proms as well. That would have been great. Good try, boys. Perhaps we'll have better luck next time. And we all hope there will be next time. And if there is a next time, why not go for the double? Why not try and get ITV as well? Think of the advances. No linger longer, Max. No stars on Sunday. then for Fiona Schwab Razor on Magna Carta the 19th. And here comes Catherine Latham Jones on Heat, a fine filly wrist, <laughs> captured a yellow rosette at the Pony Club trials at Galveston Park in Kapemba, trained by her mother, Mrs. Heather Latham Jones. And the clock has started. Here she comes. Hello, Catherine. Yes, you do look lovely. Now, work to be done. Let's take the first jump. Now, dig in. Plenty of time on the clock. Oh, beautifully clear, darling. You sell right over. Now get up and go back round for him. <laughs> Remount. Now that's the wrong foot in the stirrup, isn't it? Cap well, never mind, never mind. Save time. Get on. Mummy will guide you from here. Now it's the water next. Just let him find his stride. And yes, he's over. Well, don't panic, darling. Just swim to the side and get out. <laughs> Be brave, my love, and remount. Oh, side saddle. Good idea, my love. <laughs> now it's the wall next. The wall. Just give it all you've got, darling. Super try. No, it's all right. Most of the bricks miss the judges. <laughs> Just carry on to the pretty little rustic gate. Yeah, well, well, let him finish the bush. He probably needs the energy. <laughs> Ready? And over. Well, that was lovely. And don't worry about the gate. He's bound to shake it off sooner or later. <laughs> Spirits up. It's your favorite, the double. Well, let him rub noses with Polly's nightmare. He just wants to apologize for what he did to her this morning. <laughs> No, he doesn't. He wants to do it again. Um, <laughs> just, just hang on tight, my sweet, and try not to look down. It's just a little game they're playing. <laughs> oh, God. All right, all right, I think he's finished. Now, address him to... Well, let him. Let him. He did drink an awful lot of the water jump. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> now, let's do the final one with flying colours. Bring him in and... Lovely, darling. You only just grazed the bottom bar. Mummy is so proud of you. Now, bow to the judges. Catherine, where are you going, dear? Catherine, that's the car park. Well, never mind about the bridle. Just hold on to anything. Except that. Hello. <laughs> I'm an actor. <laughs> and I used to suffer from a terrible dandruff problem. <laughs> I was really very self-conscious about the whole thing. I didn't dare wear any dark clothes at all. And then a friend <laughs> suggested I try Carlsberg Special. <laughs> and after about five of those, I get so drunk I don't give a toss what I look like. <laughs> Excuse me, Sarah, Mr. Franz Kafka to see you. Thank you, Mrs. Handful. Send him in, would you? <laughs> Hello. 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 Nice to see you, Franz. Do sit down. <laughs> sit down on the door, that's right. <laughs> well, Franz, you've had the yep. first line and a couple of cocked up sound effects. So, uh... <laughs> so let's get on with it, shall we? Uh huh. Yeah. Now, I've read your manuscript, uh, Franz, uh, Metamorphosis, Metamorphosis uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I think you yeah. called it, yes. And to be perfectly frank with you, I was a bit troubled with it. Oh, uh, which particular bit? The first line. <laughs> What's wrong with it? Well, it may possibly be a misprint, but it appears to me to read, As Grigor Samza awoke one morning from uneasy dreams, he found himself transformed in his bed into a gigantic insect. That's right, yeah, uh-huh. Oh, I see. Well, uh, I love most of it, I mean... Uh, as Grigor Samza awoke one morning from uneasy dreams, he found himself in his bed, is very good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he wakes up, it's morning, he's in his bed, all good naturalistic stuff. Yep. But this transforming into a gigantic insect sticks out a bit, doesn't it? 
but uh, that's the whole point of the story. I, I know think. it is. Yeah. I know it is, and yeah. quite right, too. I mean, I'm no Philistine. I love a good novel, especially an original one. And this is certainly original. Mm. I mean, Dickens never wrote a novel called Dombey and Moth, did he? <laughs> <laughs> and who ever heard of Thomas Hardy's Far From the Madding Earwig? <laughs> but if I may, I'd like to suggest a slight rewrite. How does this sound? As Grigor Samza awoke one morning from uneasy dreams, he found himself with only 20 minutes left to go to work. How's that? Yes, you, you've left out the bit about him being transformed into a gigantic insect, haven't Did you? I? Did I? Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I did. Uh, well, I think that the idea that he's overslept and might be late for work and lose his job adds the same sense of fear, tension and desperation as him being turned into a giant beetle, doesn't it? Yeah. All right, then, well, how about this? As Grigor yep. Samsa awoke one morning, he realised he was very late for work, mm -hmm. and as if that wasn't bad enough, he'd also been transformed into a gigantic... <laughs> <laughs> Is that all right? No, look, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's the idea of him, you know, the man, Grigor Samsa... Grigor, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> turning into something that worries me. Well, it worried him as well. Yeah, I'm sure it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's just too incredible. All right, all right. How about... How about... Hang on. on. How about, as Grigor Samsa awoke one morning, he found himself in bed with a gigantic insect. <laughs> well, it's better. Good Lord, thought Samsa. My wife's turned into a six-foot grasshopper. No, no, <laughs> Fran, it's not just the gigantic insect. That's really? Safe. Yeah, no. no. <laughs> it's the whole story. I mean, it's a bit dull. It lacks action and interest. You see, nowadays you've got to be commercial. Books need action, sex, suspense. OK, OK. What, what about this? Grigor Samsa awoke one morning after a night of passionate lovemaking with the mysterious lady mm. who works for a hostile mm. Eastern government. Good, go on. She had left in the early hours, taking with her some vital and secret documents. Yep, fine, fine. Grigor raised one of his six black shiny legs. No, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is dreadful. Is it? It's I don't know. Yeah. Is it? <laughs> this is dreadful. You can't expect to come in here with this sort of gibberish, I mean, <laughs> men turning into insects. I'm afraid I'm going to have to swat you. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> Miss Handfuls, could you come in here for a moment and wipe Mr. Kafka off the desktop, please? Yes, sir. Oh, and sir, there's just one more client to see you. Show him in. <laughs> ah, Mr. Orwell, about these talking pigs. <laughs> And now on Injury Time, Licence pairs its competition corner. And tonight's competition, get ready, is what is the phone number of the BBC? All right. What is the phone number of the BBC? So, if you think you've got the answer, give us a ring here at the Beeb on 246 <laughs> enjoyed that program that was injury time starring robert bathus martin bergman rory mcgrath jimmy mulville and emma thompson it was written by rory mcgrath martin bergman and jimmy mulville with additional material by owen brenman and guy jenkin and the program was produced by jeffrey the butcher perkins if you hated that it was the Perkins way produced by david hatch <laughs> If you have enjoyed Injury Time, you may be interested to know that the programme is now available in LP form. And should you wish to purchase a copy, these are obtainable from the producer, Geoffrey Perkins. So, if you write to him at, uh, at his home address, not at the office, because, well, between you and me, this record isn't a BBC enterprise, it's... Well, Geoffrey's got this little record company of his own, you see, in his attic in Wilsdon. Also, he's bought this little shop in Soho, so if you want any soft porn and marital aids, kinky underwear and bespoke tailoring suits, fruit and veg, you know.